everyone and welcome to the latest edition of This Racing Life and the starting stalls of the season are well and truly open. In fact, we're almost halfway into the flat season proper. Here's what's coming up. Like a strike rate like that only comes because things are done 200% correctly. Uh, it's the small things that make huge differences. We do the basics right, good bedding, good feed, um, good training. I'd love to train a horse to win a race. And if that's all I ever did, if I can win one race, and that's all I achieve, that would be just magic. We run media courses, we run racing secretaries courses, we've got the BHA development course which is with us at the moment, getting people into the administration and marketing side of the sport, so there's just so many opportunities. Um, you don't have to be a rider uh, to get involved with the sport of horse racing. First up, Dylan Kuna, a trainer whose epic journey to Newmarket is unlikely to be matched. In my whole uh, career in school, I wanted to be a racehorse trainer. And um, I was fascinated going in the mornings with my dad, seeing the horses work and seeing the jockeys. As a kid, you love a jockey. Um, I don't know why, but you do. <laughs> and um, so I wanted to be a racehorse trainer. I left school and he said, well, if you want to be a trainer, you must learn everything from the bottom. Go and be a stable lad in England, basically a groom. Um, so I came to England. I did that for three years and then went to the champion trainer in South Africa, was assistant trainer for him and then started training on my own. And had success at a young age as well. You were just 28 when you hit a top level winner, winning the Summer Cup. Take me back to that. Yeah, I was 28 years old when I won the Summer Cup, which was a Group 1. I had a uh, Group 3, Group 1 double on the day. And before that, we had nice horses. A filly called Coconut Grove had won nine races and a listed race. Um, we had had horses placed in a Group 1. Pacific Warrior had run third in the Gold Cup, which was a Group 1 um, a month or two before that. And the horse who won that actually came and ran third or fourth to Yates in the Gold Cup here. So, I mean, the form is as good as it is anywhere. Um, so I'd done well as 28 years old. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd done it my whole life, so it's pretty much, I came back here after years of doing it and straight back into it, like you say. It's just, it's in me, it's in my soul, I think. If you were to just know that information and then find out you're now training here, you'd assume, oh, he's had a long, mm. successful career in South Africa and wants to try his hand at another country. Yeah. It wasn't like that. No, um, I, I became an airline pilot in between that. I stopped in, I think, 2009. It took flying up full time, had a great career in the airline. Um, really enjoyed it. It was charter flying, um, flying for private people, and then doing some freighter flying, and then got into a really nice airline in South Africa, and then that closed down and came back here. So I was out of it for a good 12 years, I think, and then came back into it. But like I said, because I'd been in it my whole life, um, just got straight back into it, straight back on the horse, so to speak. Um, and in between that, I bought a horse halves with my dad every year while I was flying. So we had three or four horses together the whole time. And we still pre-trained them ourselves. And so I still stayed in it, but just not, um, just not full-time training. But the paperwork in, involved with actually getting your trainer's license as well, you would just assume, and someone who's won an international group one would be able to say, I'm turning up and I'm going to be at this premises. That wasn't as easy as that. No, it's not. It wasn't easy. I had to first get a clearance from the South African National Horse Racing Authority, which is basically like the BHA here. And then um, there's a whole lot of paperwork you've got to submit to them. They wanted records of everything, your um, disciplinary record from them your statistical record it was a lot to get that going back 12 years and then once that was all cleared um, you got it they made me do the trainers modules which were brilliant um, highly recommended for anyone doing it like I said to you earlier just chatting made lots of connections through that and then after that you have to have a certain amount of money in your bank account um, you have to have stables uh, you have to have three horses it was a long process it took I started the process in August, September, and by the time I got the license, it was March. That's how long it took, and that was flat out working at it every day. Yeah, it wasn't just 
if they asked me for something, I gave it to them within five minutes, but it's still a long process. No one thought it was going to be easy, you pitching up into Newmarket and yeah. hopefully getting that first winner on the board. And it, it did come, but there was a little bit of trial and error involved. Yeah, it, it was tough. I mean, we started with three horses, two horses who were never going to run really as two-year-olds. Mr. Fires, who was literally untrainable. Um, uh, he did well. He ran, I think, in his first nine starts in six weeks, kind of thing for us, and ran six places, earned prize money six times. But that was as good as he was. Um, he's now run second, second, first this year. And then we had two two-year-olds, Silver Sword and Expressionless, who were more three-year-olds. And so they ran, Silver Sword refused to race twice, which was just the nail in the coffin for me, really. <laughs> Jeepers. And then, um, but this year they've come out as three-year-olds and they've run five times, four wins in a second. So it was always, we always knew what we had. We just had to bide our time. And then Mighty Mind came in as a horse in training, which is what we desperately needed. And he won. And a week later, um, Mollywood, came as a horse in training and ran fourth in the Shergar Cup for us, which was a huge boost for us. <clears throat> because it's not a winner, the public don't really know about it. For, but for us as a yard and the morale, we had had Mollywood for five or six weeks. And for him to come and run fourth, beaten less than a length in the Shergar Cup was, it's huge. It, that buzz and that confidence that you've still got it and know what you're doing, lasts through the winter for us, kept us going, put it that way. Yeah. I'd imagine that wasn't the first time that most people had heard your name because you, you hold a, a great social media presence, you're forever posting, it's, it's yeah. great to get your name out there. The social media for me was, I knew no one, so it was the only way to meet people and get to know people. So I started with the three horses we owned ourselves, I didn't have one owner, um, and from that built it up to 30 horses with this basically on the social media. You can get your name out that way, but winners are the best way of doing it but bar none yeah. and silver sword winning a, a sky bet sunday series race mm. must have helped immeasurably for us we don't have a lot of horses like i was showing you up at warren hill earlier some of the yards one string up warren hills more than a whole yard put together so we're squeezing the lemon dry with a handful of horses that are running but we've got some unraced horses to come and we're running at a 22 to 25 percent strike rate through the whole season so that's what matters to us that one and four winning and they're running well um, we can only do our best with what we've got and we don't have much at the moment but well, we've got a lot more than what we started with and you've got to have the right people around you as well the vibe around here is great for a small team but a very experienced one at that yeah um we've got a great team uh, you've got to have a good team um, there's so much going into like a strike rate like that only comes because things are done 200 percent correctly. It's the small things that make huge differences. We do the basics right, good bedding, good feed, good training. We don't sweat the small things but we focus on getting all the small things right and our team is unbelievable. I haven't had any previous experience of working with any trainers or yards. Um, really my role, role with Dylan really is um, the, more the race planning side and um, at the moment, well I'm, I'm all, all the while just building up my sort of path in, blood, in bloodstock. So um, the client base that I've got at the moment, I've sort of put all my eggs in one basket with Dylan just because I thought it was a good idea and it's seeming, seeming to be paying off at the moment. Uh, and I'm sure it will continue to do so. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been the first sort of venture into, it, into, into the sport really for me, aside from tipping. I think race planning is something a lot of people think they can firstly do and that it would firstly be easy. It is nowhere near as easy as it may first come across though. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very complex. It helps. Um, we got m myself and Dylan have a good friend um, Bob who we do it, we do it with together. Really, and it's almost like just bounce ideas off each other. And um, yeah, you've got. He comes in very handy with uh, track knowledge, having like a lot more years of experience on on me for sure. And also with Dylan, really in in, in terms of British racing and knowing the tracks inside out. You know, knowing knowing which which maidens tend to be weaker and you know down, down the years just off the bat uh, it's qu quite handy to have that uh, yeah certainly not an easy task um, and there's always you know there's, a, there's never really a necessarily a right or wrong decision particularly when you're looking at like you know naught to 80s not 70s and you've got three options it's it's a lot like the game is a game of, it's a game of opinions at the end of the day sometimes we might make the wrong decision but hopefully 
you know, we're, we're making the right decision more often than not and helping the whole idea, the whole idea obviously is to help Dylan um, increase, keep his strike rate, keep his strike rate to 25% throughout the year would be handy. You no, know, when you're starting out in South Africa, everyone knows the name and even internationally the name's recognised, so it's big shoes to fill, but I'm, you know, grateful to have the opportunity to try and do my part in filling those shoes, so it's, it's an honour actually to have that name. For a young rider especially, trying to put your, your name out there, your first name, not just your yeah. surname, is it a blessing and a curse in equal measure? I would say so, because you know, when you're starting out, everyone sort of knows you by your surname, and it's great, but also it's, you need to sort of make your own identity and your own, your own name for yourself. So it's always been a bit of a challenge to sort of be known that for myself and not Pierre Stradham, which is, uh, I would say is one of the best. You know, so it's, it's always a challenge, but it's something I aspire to do, is to make my own name as well. Well, it seemed like a fast enough start for you, touching down in March and not long after you were off the mark at Nottingham. Yeah, it was a, it was a great start. So sort of arrived in March, got things rolling pretty quickly. Fortunate enough that Dylan gave me the opportunities and you know, to ride a, a winner at my second meeting was unbelievable. You know, I was going there, I was like, just to have the opportunity to ride, I was excited for and for, for him to come and win was, was even better. Did you walk the track beforehand? Did you get a feel yeah. for the track as a whole? Yeah, it's, I must say, it's, walking the tracks here, it's been a lot different to South Africa. It's always sort of flat racing, but yeah, you, when you walk the tracks, you really get to experience how different each track is, and each track has its unique undulations and stuff like that. Going from Brighton, which is, I think, the most <laughs> daunting ups and downs, and then going to Epsom, which was great, and it's, it's a great experience, I think, and it really sort of improves your riding to learn those tracks and how different each of them are. Well, these undulating tracks you seem to be thriving on as well. You mentioned the, the Epsom win for yeah. Expressionless, a great day all around. Yeah, that was a really a special day. You know, we went to a walk the course before that. It was just to know that the, the history at the track of all the great horses winning there, and just for me to get a chance to ride there was unbelievable. And then I was there from the first race, so it was a, it was a long wait the last but well worth it and it was really a, a day of dreams really to be able to have my first winner at a race course like that it was quite surreal. It was, it was almost a relief when you look over here sometimes and see that there are heads out of boxes yeah. and like what you've it been is. able to, yeah. to build up for yeah. especially this lad. Yeah Silver he's the baby of the yard the big boy the one who's caused me the most stress. Jeez. Two refusals in the, the first two races. The stress you've caused me, and now you're the best horse. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, the stress. What was the change? Was there any change? Yeah, we lots. We basically changed the way we ran him, um, schooled him over hurdles, um, schooled him in the stalls in the dark, pitch black. You three schooled o'clock him over in the morning. Hurdles? Yeah, he's a great hurdler. Yeah, he's honestly a proper hurdler. Wow. Loves it. Never seen a horse love a hurdle like him. Is that just to switch something just up in his mind and keep him to get him going forward, yeah. animated? Just to get him going forward, because he has oh. to look where he's going, focus him going forward, not backwards. Um, that really worked. That's what changed him, the hurdles. And he loves it. He still goes once, once every two weeks for a school. Really? He loves it. It's his favourite thing to do. Absolutely and, loves it. And that wouldn't be unique to him? That would be something that if another horse showed that, you'd, that would <clears> be all our, all our horses school once a month, all of them. Even the babies, all of them. Um, I do with all of them. It's sprinters, everything. Do you yeah. have a dual license? Yeah, but don't have any jumpers. <laughs> any interest? Yeah, I would love to have some for the winter. Yeah, It'd be nice, but we don't have any. It would be great to get them. Um, but they're all school anyway. Um, they love. They really enjoy it. It's different. Uh, it's not a hard schooling session. They have a few. We put them in the loose school, warm them up a bit. They have a few jumps, and then we pop them over the three training jumps, and then they go home. Did he take to it like a duck to water? Honestly, from the beginning, love. first time he from saw From the first thing, he just loves it. And he loves it. The lads around him say that's when he gives him the best feel I've ever heard of. <laughs> he loves it. Yeah, so he's got a... That was starting to be in the back of my mind if he refused again. That was going to be the step. The last chance was going to be mm. hurdles. A few other options. But thankfully, he's much better than that now. Yeah. One thing I learned, and this is, was a real lesson, this is what I try and tell the staff. Um, when you only have three horses, you realise how how hard it is to get the next horse. So, I mean, I sat the whole year last year with three horses, and then Mighty Mine and Mollywood came. So then we were up to five, but to, it was, I thought, 
yeah, so I thought horses were never going to come. And so you've got to give every horse your best and give it as much chance as you can because to, to replace them is unbelievable. And I've had people from Kuwait try to buy horses off me for cheap and I said to them, I know the horses may be worth what you're offering, but to me it's worth so much more because it's so hard to replace that horse. Like him, I know he's worth four, five hundred grand to Hong Kong, but to me he's worth a million because it's so hard to replace him. And it, the coverage I get is, I mean, this, the ITV coverage I got on the Sunday series with him was priceless. And South Africa is one of the very few racing jurisdictions that our next guest didn't gain his racing tutelage because after 30 years behind the scenes and trips all the way around the world, Patrick Owens finally has his name on the sign outside this stable here in Newmarket. Let's go and see what he has to say. I didn't know I was going to go training, you know, I always knew I was going to work in the racing industry. I always wanted to train, but I didn't know if it was going to happen, you know, but I always wanted to train in Ireland. I thought, you know, Ireland's home. So I, I moved back to Ireland, but, you know, that was just ridiculously tough. It was, so I was breaking in and, you know, hunt horses and all that, sport horses over there. So I had to make a decision and my good friend Ollie Stevens was pre training in Surrey at the time. So I said, I'm going to move to England. I still hadn't contemplated going training, you know, at this stage I was going to go pre-training. And he said, Pat, I'll support you. I also made the decision that it was a case of if I want to get some horses, I got to go somewhere where there's a horse population, you know, in a certain area like Newmarket was the place to come. So Ollie would send me a few and hopefully I could build up more contacts, which I did and the kind of the pre-training stemmed from there. With my partner Amy, we built it up, you know, from nothing. We started pre-training out of field shelters in a field. We had no electricity. Uh, you know, there was no concrete base on the stables. It was made of chalk, so we were scooping out water when it rained a lot so it was uh it was tough but sounds we, ideal yeah it was beautiful <laughs> great place to start but it was the summer was lovely but it was tough but we made it work and we put some good horses through our hands you know and kind of progressed from there really so what was the major catalyst to actually taking out your license i loved the pre-training i loved following the horses careers and I used to come some mornings and watch the horses on the heat and it kind of got my ambition going that, you know, I really, I'd love to train and I was like, I'd love to train a horse to win a race. And if that's all I ever did. But it was thanks to Amy that she said, you know, Pat, you're meant to train. But for me, it was like, if I can win one race, and that's all I achieve. That would be just magic, and we've done it. You mentioned your partner, Amy. Yeah. She seems absolutely integral to the business. It's very much a, a team effort from the pair of you, and w one without the other. It wouldn't work, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Amy is the reason I'm training. When we were, she used to ride some of the breakers when we were breaking in as well. She's ridden a lot of winners. Uh, but she does all the logistics, all the admin, helps with the training. I'll come out and watch the horses train and finding re the right races. Yeah, without Amy, there'd be no Patrick Owens racing, basically. That's the bottom line, so. I'm assuming day one was a mixture of pure excitement and s scary as well. Yeah, it was, because we came in here to the authorised yard with one horse, you know. <laughs> yeah. 25 boxes so we still had to pay the rent so we get one horse is how it started so it was a case of like you say it was like i can't believe i'm doing this but at the same time it's like there's 24 <laughs> other stables what are we going to do but do you know what you just come in and you got a passion inside you you gotta you look in the manger it's just, they've eaten up from the night before and you're like it gives you a little buzz six winners in 2021 yeah. prize money and winner title was up in last season as well yeah as well as the quality of the horse yes too. and that's i've always wanted to train good horses do you know i, I know everyone i don't does. think you'd be alone in that no <laughs> i don't think so but you want to go in and you want to be going if it's not the big tracks and the big days it gives you a buzz you know you get butterflies mm -hmm. you, you know, 
even when you go into a big track and it's not a big day, you walk in, you see the grandstand and you know, you look at the course and you think of the horses that have won there and the trainers that have trained winners and it gives you, puts a bit of fire in your belly and it gets you excited and that's what you want. So it's, you know, we're lucky and I think I've been lucky where I've learned through my travels, like I still ride out. So it's nice to be able to sit on a horse and be able to come back and tell an owner, Do you know what, I think, I think this is a nice one. You know, I think we can dream a little with this horse. And it's, uh, but it is nice to have the quality, but you know, you've got to, you got to, every horse gets the same treatment. Every horse is as important and, you know, it's, uh, you treat them all right and you do the right thing. They'll reach the level, you know, they, they deserve to be at and they, they'll reward you. Hopefully we'll have a good year this year and you know we've found another nice horse for this season. You certainly have and he's named Odyssey. It's, yeah. it's been somewhat of an odyssey yeah. to begin with because while it didn't quite click at Yarmouth, yeah. you had a big day at Ascot. Yeah, it's magic, you know. He always, he trained like a nice horse mentally. You know, he's always very professional. Beautiful horse to look at even though you know, he's a Ulysses and it'll be nicer this year, but the frame and everything is there and he's progressing with training physically and with his races. But um, we knew he'd a nice horse going into Yarmouth, but it was a very tough spot. You know, it was a very hot race. Um, and we knew he was going to improve for it. He was going to learn a lot from his first race mentally, but what I liked is as well, physically he strengthened up for his first race. We gave him time off after that, you know, just didn't like a few, three, four, five days off, just taking it easy, not riding him. But yeah, he really, Ascot, he, he stepped up and he really, he stepped forward. Like Yarmouth, he galloped out good after the line and that said to us, you know, step up and trip is what this horse is really going to thrive on. And, you know, a strong run race at Ascot. And it, it, everything just came together. He didn't win, but it was as good as a win. It's one of those cases that you really had a bold call to make. You yeah. went off 125 20, yeah. to one. The conditions of the race were perfect. Yeah. And he was by Ulysses. Yeah. You had to back yourself and you did. Yeah, it was, uh, in this game, you have to have a lot of self-confidence, I believe, especially being a small trainer. Cause I always feel if you're, a big trainer and you see some trainers now and they've already had 60, 70, 80 individual runners, you know, five, 10 of them don't step up. That's fine. You know, I find not in an arrogant way, I have a lot of self-confidence and like going to Ascot with Odyssey, I had belief in the horse, belief in myself that I knew this horse can run a solid race. Now, if he'd be finished mid div and been beaten three, four lengths, would have been over the moon, but I wasn't going there thinking, you know, he is going to run like 125 to one shot. I thought, you know, this could, he could run big and he did run big. You know, we live dreams and there are certain big races you'd love to win. But for us, we'll do the right thing for him and see how he comes out of this race and then make a plan. He will have a break, uh, a nice little holiday towards the end of the year before the weather gets cold. He'll be turned away when the sun is out and there's green grass for him to, you know, we won't, you probably won't go for any big race when the weather's turned. So we believe he'll be a nice horse next year and it's up to me to guide him along the right path and do the right thing. But I know there's a big day in him and uh, yeah, it's, you know, I got to do the right thing, train him the right way and do the right thing. The more immediate dream is getting those placed horses and stakes horses to become winning horses. Winners, ones, yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, that's, you need, that's where you need the luck. You know, you can run these horses in these big races and it's just, you might just get knocked side or something could cost you that half a length of neck. And, you know, we've proven we're put, we know what we've got. We're running them in these right, black type races, you know, they're not out of place. And I just think now it's just a little bit of luck to get us over the line. And please God, if that happens, then they'll start to flow.
And who knows, if all goes well for Pat in the years to come, he'll be needing more staff. Where better to source them than the British Racing School? 40 years on the map now, they've been providing staff and personnel up and down the country for racing yards. There's more horses, there's more courses, and there's plenty to be excited about for the future. We do look after jockey coaching programme on behalf of the sport, but our real focus is on stable staff training uh, and training the riders of the future, so those are the people who are riding horses day in, day out in the mornings, getting them ready to go racing. Um, and across the spectrum, so we run media courses, we run racing secretaries courses, we've got the BHA development course, which is with us at the moment, which has been a, a long running and really successful course, getting people into the administration and marketing side of the sport. So, so there's just so many opportunities. Um, you don't have to be a rider. Uh, to get involved with the sport of horse racing. Um, we're trying to open as many people's eyes to that as we can. One of your newer ones is the Gerald Lee Charitable Trust course. Just tell me a little bit about that. That's right, so we're really fortunate that Gerald Lee Foundation came forward to fund uh, some week-long courses. They're introductory courses, just taster weeks, and really designed for, for young people who wouldn't have uh, normally have considered horse racing or even working with horses um, and, and need a bit of extra support to to get into it so they would come on those taster weeks and the hopes is that some of them will then feed on to our foundation courses um, which are which are longer and, and more intense but they they feed on to those and, and eventually get a job in racing uh, and I think really key for Gerald Lee Foundation was just giving opportunities to young people who perhaps haven't had the best start in life, perhaps haven't you know, had access to horse and ponies or indeed to a lot of outdoor activities, um, just give people a chance to come and, come and try it, interact with horses and ponies and, um, and then we, we take it from there. I'm one of the instructors here on the yard, uh, so my role is to uh, bring the young people on from in every aspect, so even it just be from mucking out to grooming the horses, the horse care and looking after them, and to um, hopefully see their riding progression so that they're ready to go into the workplace and going up the gallops comfortably by the time they leave, whether that be on a, a six week or a 12 week or an 18 week course. Is it, I'm imagining it's the case that some progress quicker than others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then sometimes the ones that are, are stronger when they arrive are caught up by some of the other students whilst they're here. Yeah, I mean, in any, in any role we all learn at different speeds, don't we? Whether it's walking, talking, running, riding racehorses, it's, yeah. So in our riding, we obviously ride in the indoor first and the outdoor, then we move to the rounds and then at the end of the straights, um, learning about going up the stools and jumping over the hurdles, depending what, if we want to go into flat or jump yards. Um, and then in the evenings, we do sessions on horse health, like gambling and the risks of it and fitness as well to obviously keep us fit. Every day is different. You know, we see different problems, different successes every day of the week with the students. I'm sure every pupil is different as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and all the horses are different to ride. And I, I try to emphasize to the students, just because one student's ridden a horse and it's gone well or, or it's gone badly, it doesn't mean to say that it will for the next students. And um, my philosophy as an instructor is try and get them to ride as many different horses as possible. Um, my record for two of the young lads that were here on a course a few, few courses ago, uh, one lad rode 73 and another rode 71 horses in their 12 weeks here. So yeah, get them on as many different ones as we can and get them to try and adapt to each different horse and to each different horse's needs. There isn't a bottomless pit of money that you're just handed. This is a charity um, and you have fundraising days coming up as well. That's right, yeah. So we're, we're using our, our 40th birthday to try and get the message out there that we are a charity and the, the more support we can get and we can uh, have from our funders, the more the more we can do for, for young people and for the sport of horse racing. Um, we've got a family fun day coming up on the 22nd of July, open to all, so if you're in the area, just pop in for a couple of hours or indeed spend the whole day here. We've got lots of events planned. Um, some of us staff are gonna uh, give show jumping a go on some of our retired race horses, so that will um, uh, may or may not go well, but uh, we'll be entertaining, that's for sure. 
So that's it for the latest edition of This Racing Live. Thanks to Dylan Cooner, thanks to Patrick Owens, and thank you to the British Racing School. If you can make it to their family fun day on the 22nd, then please do. From us, it's a very good bye. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.